Thank you, Kenny. So I want to start by thank you, Kenny Mariello, for the invitation to talk a little about my recent work in Shenatra, talk a little about some of my now has been what more than 10 years already work with Shenatra. So it's always a pleasure to talk about them. And in today's talk, I decided to highlight some of the recent interests that I have been developed in the last three years or so that is help us how can we optimize the research resources we have available. I am from Brazil and as many other countries in South America or global South in general, uh, we struggle with resource and also with uh, people to help us in the field. So if you are able to find ways to direct more or attention to critical areas that we have interest in, might find a way to potentialize the research we have. So I see the work of scientists in general as a way to feel a gigantic puzzle that seems endless. And each small project has contributed to one puzzle to this big piece. So each grant, each graduate student project, each undergraduate student project, volunteer work, help us add one small piece to that big puzzle. However, the gaps are too big and the results are too limited. So the reality is we need to find ways to prioritize our efforts and resource. And we have been doing that over time from different ways. So for example, we have the way to see which species deserve more or attention based on the extinction vulnerability risk. So we have the IUCN that allow us to combine a lot of research and have this try to be as much accurate as possible way to understand which species uh, are more critically threatening and which species are more in need to our attention before there was no more opportunity to save them. And another way is through priority areas. So usually we try to understand which areas has a higher diversity, a higher endemism, or even a higher habitat loss that we need to focus our attention now as a priority before it's too late. So these are ways people have found to try to make better of the research and efforts we have. So today talk, I'm gonna address two recent research that we published. Both of them, the idea is help us to prioritize, but in different scales, in different perspectives. So the first one, actually you start with the simple question about the nutrients is how well the neotropic is, is sampled in relation to genotropics. And up to very recently, it was very hard to actually have this idea, this quantification, because the data was quadri or across different database museums that were not easily accessible. So even this very basic understanding was very hard to, to have a clear idea. But in 2019, over 500 authors, I believe, Many of you that are listed now might have contributed to this database, which was led by Paloma Santos during her PhD. So because of this big collaboration, people were very willing to share even non-published data. So we were able to combine these 42,000 records of Shenatra across the whole neotropics. And these include data from the museum collection, from field surveys, from uh, uh, ecological studies from road kill animals. So it's a very, very comprehensive database which open a series of possibilities to explore and to understand motion natural in a way that before was not possible or at least not easy to be done. So since the publication of this database, we were now able to start to have a better idea about how well sampled is the neotropics for Shenatras. So the first thing we decide to do is to have a better idea of how the sampling is distributed. So for this map of points, it's hard to have a better idea because there is a lot of overlap. 
So you cannot really tell how many points are distributed. So the first thing we did was to create this density map that shows through grids how many points, how many records of Shenatron has been recorded across each of these grid cells that is 100 kilometers per 100 kilometer. So this gave us a much easier way to visualize and we can easily start to see some interesting patterns. For example, there is a lot of gray area in the Amazon and there is a lot of reddish area in central Brazil, northwestern central Brazil. But it's still, I mean, it's start to be clear, but it's still we were interested in go deeper on this exploration. So we start to filter just to have a better understanding of how concentrated are the records. So for example, if you do a series of filters of how many grid cells with more records, how many percent is covering the neotropics? So for example, in the first map, we selected only grid cells with more than 10 records. And then that's the remaining cells. These cover about 19% of the neotropics. And if you keep going and going, when we reach 50 records per grid cell, we only have these few remaining, and that's about 6% of the neotropics. So actually, the questions start to appear more clear. And if you go like to overall summary, we have that actually half of the neotropics have not a single record of Shenatri. As I say, only 6% has more than 50 records, and the Amazon and the Central America are clearly the lowest coverage area for Shenatris in general, in terms of sampling. And another thing we realized that in many situations, the sampling records reflect acknowledgement on the species uh, understanding or biology we know about the species. So for example, most of the endemic Shenatris from the Amazon are those that we have the lowest information available in terms of biology, in terms of habitat requirements, in terms of uh, reproduction. So basically information general. So understanding the sampling actually can help us have a better idea about the understanding of the species itself. We did a new analysis that kind of try to have a more statistical background and give us an idea of significant level of sampling. And through this analysis, we found that only 4% of the neotropicals actually have, can be considered well sampled. And those in red here concentrate about 42% of all Shenatra records compiled in this database. So it's a really unbiased distribution across the neotropicals. But then we were curious what could be related to this very uh, bias distribution of records. So previous research in other groups and other continents found the effect of some human uh, building, human influence on this bias in recording species. So for example, roads, rivers, cities, people try to sample close to these areas due to accessibility. So we decided to explore this and then ask, are any of these affecting the distribution of sampling in Shenatra? And the, resu the result is clear. If you see the neotropics as a unique unit, about 40% of all records are within a five kilometers from a road. So basically what we did is we calculate the distance from each record to the nearest road, river, city, or even protected area. So these are the numbers and it's quite interesting to see because if you think on our field work for those who used to go to the field work, kind of makes sense because we try to, in many areas it's hard to access. So being close to a road makes more accessible to do the, to do the field surveys. But this part name might not be nicely applied if you see the whole neutral because are you one unique unit. So we decided to explore for each biome. And the result shows clear difference between the bias 
and related to accessibility across biomes. So if you separate open biomes like the temporary grassland uh, or the savannas in central Brazil, they both have something common. They both have a very strong influence of roads on the spatial distribution of Shenatra records. And if you go to the forest biomes, both the Amazon and Atlantic forests, we find that protected areas has actually been more targeted for Shenatra studies. And in the Amazon, the river has had the most influence uh, compared to the other biomes, which makes sense given the large uh, volumes of the rivers in the Amazon. While in the Atlantic forest, we have also a very strong influence of roads. So these start to give us a better idea of not just the pattern, but what has underlined this, this pattern of sampling across the neotropics. So the answer to my initial question is no, the neotropic is not well sampled for Shenatras. So we do need to find a ways to try to fill these gaps and find a ways to focus on next effort and research. So this priori prioritization actually is not a simple thing to do because we can approach this in different perspectives. We can approach these in different uh, and different needs or in different interests in even. So for example, we can target area that has a higher diversity of Shenatron to study because we might have a high likelihood of success in, in finding Shenatron where there are more species living together. Or we can find, we can focus on area that has high human impact because those areas has clearly been an important, uh, has clearly driving population decline over the years. So we decide to do both. On a diverse perspective, we first build this map that was very important for this next step. We decided not to use the overall range maps because uh, in my case, in many cases, my not accurate represent the distribution of the species. But most important is because across the range of the species, we do not expect that we will have the similar likelihood, the similar uh, frequency of occurrence across the range, but, do, but they will vary. So in some areas of the range, they might be more common and other areas less common. So we decided to use species distribution modeling, which give us a, a, a kind of gradient of habitat suitability. So we run models for 34 species, which we had enough points, enough occurrence points to generate the models. And we combine all of them and project it in the same uh, resolution as we did for the sampling richness. So again, in the grids of 100 kilometers square. And when we have these two databases, we're able to compare and then ask the simple question, which areas we have a high diversity of Shenatron that has been under uh, sampled. So the map on your right shows the result of that and it clearly show the Amazon is the area that if you want to focus on uh, areas with high diversity that has been poorly assembled, we should go to the Amazon because basically all countries that hold part of the Amazon is in need of more research and is in need to understand more about the biology of the species, the threat and the habitat requirement. And there is another reason that we should focus more in Amazon is because we have been seeing a huge number of new recognized species of Shinatra and many of them come from the Amazon. And I'm aware that many more species will be recognized, even described in the next few years and they were being concentrated in the Amazon. So in addition to, we do not know enough information about those species we already know, there will be much more species recognized in the future, in the very near future, that need to be uh, studied. But if you want to focus on those areas that has a high human impact, so it's also a very valid point. So for that, we use this very recent database that combine a lot of human impact stressors, for example, urbanization, agriculture, mining, to try to use this database to do the same thing and then compare with the sampling records. 
And then when we do that, we realize that Central Argentina and Mexico and Northeast in Brazil are areas that we should pay more attention given the high human influence on those areas and the low sampling in those areas that again reflect in some level the, the available information we have for those species living in each of these regions. Another point that when we talk about efforts, when we talk about research, accessibility is a very critical thing to take into account because one of the big reasons the Amazon has been undersampled, and it's not just for Shinatran, but it's a common part for mammals and for many groups in general, is because it's very hard to access. There is no many roads, there is basically rivers and a bunch of primitive areas, especially in the western part, which is great, but which also makes very hard uh, to study them. So we wanted to give a more final detail and allow us in each context to explore what is around our area. So if we include accessibility in this equation, and in this case, we explore the density of roads, the density of rivers, the protect areas, to see how can we combine all of these and have a better visualization of areas that need our attention. So for example, when we combine the sampling with the roads density, clearly the Northeast in Brazil and the Central Argentina are areas that could be, will be welcome to have more studies, which are not very hardly accessible. So these areas can allow us to, with, for example, small grants, can easily assess all of these areas that can give us more information. And interesting, each of these areas have endemic species. One of them, the tree bandera armadillo that we're gonna talk in the second part, that is also require more information and some of them are very critical uh, situation. So this gives us a new perspective on how can we visualize the needs for increasing research and take more advantage of our resource. And then I, in the end, we decided to combine all of these maps and relate it to the sampling effort. And the resulting map is actually very impressive because it shows that any area need to be better sampled for Shenarter. Maybe except the small part of Southeast Brazil, but overall, Anywhere you are in the Neotropics that you want to develop Project Shenatra will be very welcome because there is a need for that. And I think these maps can be nicely used when you apply for grants or when you want to justify to stakeholders, to local people that you want to work with, because they clearly show areas that we need more attention in a nicely way. And to help in this regard, we also decided to make similar maps for each country around the Neotropics. So if you're working, for example, in Argentina, you can use this map to bring to the grant founding or stakeholders and shows that, see, we need to focus on these areas. And you can do that in Colombia, in Peru, anywhere in Neotropics. So these are all available in the supplementary material for our, our paper. And I really hope this could be useful to boost more these studies across the neotropics. I'm now gonna move to the second part of my presentation that is focused on a species level. So again, the same question, how can we optimize the research, the resources and efforts if you are interested in one particular species? And I bring these species into attention because it's a species that I have been working since in my master in different intensities, in different levels but it's a species that is endemic. It's the only armadillo endemic of Brazil. And it, even across Brazil, was not a very well-known species. But thanks to the World Cup in 2014, people that this armadillo was chosen to be the mascot of the World Cup. And that was actually thanks to a, a ONG in Brazil working in, in Catinga, work with armadillos that elaborated this, this idea, this proposal 
to use the armadillo ball because they have this unique ability to defense strategy that turn over the body and connect the head. As you can see here, the head and the tail in a perfect ball shape. So they use these unique features of these genus to, and the fact there is in them to Brazil to convince FIFA and the organization to use it as a mascot, which was a great idea. So the tree band and armadillo uh, for two decades was actually considered extinct in the wild. So some publications listed as one of the extinct or possible extinct because for many years, we did not have any recent record of this species, at least in the scientific literature. But uh, in 1993, it was actually report a scientific note that they were, this armadillo was not extinct and there was still population in the central area of Katinga that should be uh, studied better to avoid that actually event to be went extinct. And at the same year of the World Cup, given the good publicity for the armadillo, the Brazilian government launched these two national action plan. Actually, the first one was launched in 2014 and was completely focused on the tree burned at armadillo. So these action plans are five years uh, program to try to mitigate or reduce the threat and try to understand more about the species threatening and habitat requirement. So after it finished in 2019, the armadillo was now included in a new national action plan with two other threatened genotras in Brazil, the giant armadillo and the giant anteater. So now we are actually in the last year of the second circle of efforts. And if we compare what happened 10 years ago, we now have much more information. But of course, we still have a long way to feel confident that the population are now in a good state that can last for the next 100 years or more so. And another nice thing about this action plan is because uh, we put together a very diverse group of people, including the environment police, the local governments, uh, the stakeholders related to protected areas, and the university's research. So we have all of this perspective and different views that all come together to try one simple goal is to avoid those species to go to extinction. So overall, the goals, as I mentioned, is to improve the knowledge, to quantify and access better the remaining populations, try to find ways to mitigate or reduce the threat, and understand more what actually are the threat across the range, because we know that something that might affect the species in one area will be, might not be the same in another area. So at the almost same year when that action plan was launched, we published another paper that tried to report the number of recent, the number of population of records of armadillos that we had, the tree bonded armadillos that we have. And the numbers were quite scary, actually, because in the last 15 years uh, of that publication, only eight records of tree bonded armadillos were recorded, were available to us. And we include that uh, literature, we include ecological study, we interview people that work in the field. And that was the maximum we could come out with, eight records after the year 2000. So that was very critical and that was uh, pushed a lot of people to develop more projects in this area to try to find more of this population. And just last year, we published this new paper that presents a more up-to-date view. So we now have a much better understanding of this population, of this remaining population. So everything, all the dots, color dots, are records that were made after the year 2000, and all the grayish dots were made before that we call historical records. And many of them actually, we 
revisited some of these areas and we know the population, the tree banana manita are no longer occur in these areas. So we consider historical records. But despite being, I mean, a good increase in number of records, if you will pay attention, they are actually kind of in the same area that we knew the armadillo were found, but now we have a more understanding of the spread, but it's still they are in a similar areas, just a few cases, for example, here in the very north, we did not have this record, and now we know the, the species is still there, and some records in the central area, but overall, the core of the armadillos are still concentrating the, those areas before. So it's still a critical thing that we need to work harder to keep finding new populations. So despite this increasing in the last 10 years, there are still a lot of unknowns. It, there are several, some current projects focused on understanding more about the biology and some information has been published, which is great, but there's are still a lot of questions. For example, the habitat requirements are not clear. The, where will be my new? Where we might found new population? Uh, how can we connect those population to increase the the possibilities that we have a more health population? And what's the impact of the land use? We know that hunting is a very strong threat for these species because of this uh, strategy of stay steady and rolling up in a bowl, so it makes it very easy for hunter to capture them but it's not clear the land use impact. So all of these questions are critical if you want to define a better conservation strategy for these species. So again, the question comes, where should we focus our efforts and research? So in try to help with this question, and this can actually be applied for any poorly known species. We decided to explore several biogeographic analysis that give, can give us some of the initial insights on how can we better use or limited resource. So the first thing we did was to generate a species distribution modeling. The idea is to understand more about the habitat stability for species. So in the map on the right, you can see the red areas are areas that were considered to be high or very high suitability for the species. And this is a very common step nowadays, like species distribution model has been used commonly in conservation actions at least 20 years. But we wanted to go a little deeper and try to extract more information about this habitat suitability map. So our next question was, if this high and very high suitability area, do they share a similar climate condition? Or no, each one have their own characteristic and cannot be seen as a common pattern. So for doing that, we came out with this way to visualize in a climate uh, environment and climate space, how those high and very high suitability areas are grouped together or not. So the PCA plot on the left clearly shows that all the very or mostly of the very high and high suitability are grouped in this high top of the plot. And if you, we extrapolate this, if you try to understand what this area is related to, we found that the basically climate related to seasonality is related to this top area of the graph. And then basically the, it uh, tell us that the tree burned at Armandillo is highly dependent on areas with high seasonality, which in turn reflect to areas with more opening, dry area, and it's not very akin to forest biomes or forest regions. So this is also important to highlight because usually we think on, on uh, conservation, we try to think in big forests, Amazon area or Atlantic forest, but it's also important to keep in mind several species cannot survive in forest area and rely on these open savanna areas. So, and the tree bundle and armadillo is one clear example of that. And then we went to a second question was, okay, we know now they depend on habitat and the habitat need to be mostly dry areas with high seasonality, but what would be the best routes that we could work to increase the connectivity 
across the populations. So we did this analysis that call uh, is is on the range of circuit circuit theory. It's basically analysis that allow us to understand what are the more likelihood the species can disperse across the the range that you were studying. So the reddish area again represents the best or to possible is dispersional areas that we could use to connect the remaining population that we are aware of nowadays. So for example, these are valuable information if we want to, uh, maybe we have enough money to build a new protected area, we could try to focus on, on some of these areas that might fill gaps on the among population, but would guarantee the preservation of this area. Another information that we get from this is because most of the uplands, basically this area in, in strong red, are very important for the tree banded armadillo to look up to migrate across population. But also, if we want to protect and make them move across biomes. So in the dark gray, we have the Cerrado in Brazil, the savanna area. And in the light gray, we have the Caatingas, more dry forest. So if you want the population from these biomes to be able to communicate with each other, we also do need to pay attention to these lowland areas. So only through this map, we can start to have a lot of ideas and help us think on the next step. And the last question we had in mind was to understand the land use impacts. So basically, the first thing we did was to visualize how was each of those areas 35 years ago and now to understand how has been the habitat loss over these three decades. And then, so everything gray tones is basically anthropogenic areas or human modification areas. And you can clearly see the, the bottom map that represent the 2020 land cover. There are much more grayish cells and they start to spread more to the center of the map and diffuse along. So for example, one very amazing transformation is this area. In 18, 1985, basically there were non uh, agriculture or land transformation. And in 2020, basically the whole corner of this area has been lost. And if you, we see this in another way to make clear the impact. So basically we, what we did is everything lost, everything that in 1985 was savanna, but in 2020 was no longer savanna is showing in red. And everything in blue represent core areas. Those core areas basically the remaining of savanna or grasslands that is not in directly contact with uh, anthropo or human altered area. So the core area in a way is help us like uh, give us a, 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 has still some security before the expansion reach these blue parts. And you can clearly see, for example, in the bottle part, these are the green area, the blue areas core that remains because we have a protected area in these two extremes but everything that's outside of the protect area has been lost. And the same thing apply to the savanna vegetation. Another thing we realized seeing these maps is it seems to be a very good overlap between the blue core area and the remaining population. So we try to visualize that in another way. We ask the simple question around each of these both recent and historical records. We design a grid of eight kilometers square, and then we ask how many uh, hectares of core area remaining in these areas? And the difference is very clear. So all the recent population are in areas that has much more remaining of savanna and remaining of core areas. So this for me clearly shows that the, lo the losing the natural habitat for the tree banded armadillo is a very serious threat as they don't seem to cope very well with these areas. And based on this, we drew this heat map that shows the 
concentration of the core areas across the armadillo distribution. So as I mentioned before, those population that is in the Cerrado area are more restricted to the protected areas. Everything gray here are protected areas, but everything not in gray are outside that is non-protected now. And you can see there is a lot of concentration of core areas in these non-protected regions. So if, again, if you do have research to build a protected area, we should focus on these remaining of core areas because it will be important not just for the tree burned dead armadillo, but several other species that are limited to those areas, including the jaguar, including the giant anteater, giant armadillo. So these core areas for me now, they are basically holding the much of the remaining mammal fauna in the Caatinga and Cerrado area. So I want to conclude this part to highlight that all of this information that I present to you now were retrieved based on these only occurrence points. So this shows that for any other species that one might have only a range of points, but we can still try to help us direct the next four efforts. And we can also use this information to try to find new population of armadillos. So for example, we know the armadillos has a high likelihood in core areas. So we might go to other core areas to see if they still find new population. So I will end here and I will be happy to answer any questions. And thank you for, for watching. Thank you so much, Anderson. That was really important information you shared. And uh, I'm just gonna do a quick overview about what our specialist group does. And then uh, I'll, I'll read you some questions. So my name is Kenny Coogan. I'm the education coordinator for the IUCN SSC Anteater Sloth and Armadillo Specialist Group. We have an active website, social media, including Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you go to our website, zenarthrins.org, you will see lots of different tabs on the top. One of them includes a species where we list all 40 or so uh, species of each armadillo sloth and anteater. And uh, what else is special about our group is that we have the only scientific journal dedicated to the conservation of xenarthrins. It used to be called something else, but now we have xenarthra, which is more appropriate based on taxonomic realignment. If you are a scientist and you would like to publish your work, please send us a message. Or if you go to our website, you'll see the editorial process and the author guidelines. We publish, it's a digital uh, journal and we can publish whenever you are ready. So please keep us in mind. And then if you go to the species accounts, you will see that we have a lot of great information. And this is really for adults. It's pretty scientific and concise, but then if you go to our kids corner or if you go to our social media pages, you will see that we have five animated videos all about Xenarthrins, which are great for you to implement in your K through 12 classrooms or to share with your friends. And all of the videos, just like our website, are available in three languages, Portuguese, Spanish and English. With all of our videos, we have accompanying worksheets and puzzles and spot the differences and crossword puzzles, mazes. When you are educating others about Xenarthrins, please keep these dates in mind. These are the dates for this year. International Armadillo Day is always August 13th. It has been that for several years. International Sloth Day is always the third Saturday in October, which means the date changes. So sometimes it's on October 20th, sometimes it's on October 21st, but this year it is October 19th. And World Anteater Day is always on the 19th. Just so you know, this changed 
few years ago because the World Jaguar Day took over our Anteater Day. And because those animals overlap where they're found, it's, we don't want to compete. So everyone, get out your pens, put this in your calendar, tell your museums and your zoological institutions that these are the days we are celebrating the Xenarthrins. And if you Google these dates, and if you see a date that's posted somewhere, like on an international calendar that is wrong, please send us a message. But last year we went through all of them and we told them and a lot of people changed. So we should be good to go. Speaking about dates and events, we like to host webinars once a month. And coming up in April, we have two webinars. Usually we talk about conservation or husbandry, but for April, we are gonna be talking about the extinct glyptodons. And then we have a special presentation about if echidnas are more like xenarthrins than xenarthrins. So stay tuned for that. If you work with xenarthrins and you have photos, please send them to me at contact at xenarthrins.org because our social media platforms depend on people like you. And if you feel inspired to help save xenarthrins, you can go to our donate button. You can donate money through your PayPal and we appreciate it. But if you don't want to just give us money, you can go to our international store and they do drop shipping so they can ship anywhere in the world. And uh, you can get this really cool giant anteater with the baby t-shirt like what I'm wearing. You can get long sleeve shirts, tote bags, stickers, hoodies, mugs, and all of the proceeds go to our conservation and education initiatives. And I'd like to thank our partner institutions, FIA, the Foundation for International Aid to Animals, and Nurtured by Nature for helping support our educational programming, which includes these webinars and creating animated videos and creating educational content. And what well, we're very proud of, three months ago, we finished a interactive map. So you can click on any country in Central or South America and it will list all of the Xenarthrins that are found in that country. All right, thank you, Anderson, for listening to my spiel. Fernando says, clap, 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 emoji. Mateus says, thank you so much for the talk. And Katie, from Turtleback Zoo says, I'm wondering, are there any conservation organizations directly targeting the funding of preserving those spaces or what support is needed at the moment in that region at present? Uh, should, okay, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, Katie, so it's a very important question. So there are some organization work. So there are the Association Catinga that is specifically focused on several species that are either endemic or mainly distributed in the Catinga, that central or northeast part of Brazil. And they do this, their conservation project in different aspects. They do, on the biological part, they also involve the communities, which it's very important to keep the any conservation idea in the long run. Uh, there is the the group in Bahia, led by Flavio Miranda, which has different focus, but now it start to focus on Catinga and the tree band under Medillo together with uh, a PhD student now who has developed some ecological studies since his master. Rodolfo Magalhães. So I'm happy to see there are more and more, but considering the magnitude and the range of this area, there are still a lot to be done. So your second question about support, uh, support is welcome, I would say. And we do need support in terms like found itself to allow expanding the field work. For example, uh, Rodolfo is working specifically one area that we have a very good 
number of individuals to try to understand now not just the ecology but also the health of these animals. So we are they are collecting blood, they are uh, testing the ectoparasite, endoparasite. So, but that's for one population. There is also only one genetic study in very few individuals, and the result is actually worrisome because it shows a very low genetic diversity, which might be critical, and that's why it's so important for us to try to connect the population. But it's not clear at this moment if that low diversity is something unique for that population or something common for the panda and armadillo. So we definitely need to increase understanding more how the genetic background of those population are to understand more how what's the better action to to preserve them so we do need support in terms of funding in terms of people interested in work in the Caatinga so in Brazil we have a very good com very huge competitor is Amazon a truck in Atlantic Forest but I am a passionate for Caatinga so I do have plans to continue work there for a long time but Either people interested in or people interested in help financially is also welcome. All right, very good, Anderson. Yeah, a lot of times the U.S. zoos want to send their vet, you know, somewhere for a week, or they want to start doing special programming and you know collecting funds and then send it to an organization. Yeah, um, let me add maybe that um, there are two initiatives that are worth mentioning here. Uh, one is that the Zoological Society of London it has the EDGE um, fellowships. EDGE is evolutionary distinct and globally endangered. And the Brazilian three-banded armadillo is one of the EDGE species. So um, Rodolfo Magallanes um, who was mentioned by Anderson is actually an EDGE fellow. So he's receiving support uh, for his research. And on the other hand, sorry. Sorry, that was my dog. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the other thing is that Nurture by Nature, our partner, one of our partner institutions um, is breeding Saturn three-banded armadillos and uh, selling them to zoos. And the zoos uh, that purchase a three-banded armadillo, they have to make a donation to the Brazilian three-banded armadillo conservation program. So that's another way that we are getting some money uh, to do uh, conservation research uh, for Brazilian three-banded armadillos. That's great to hear. I did not know that, but I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> And Mindy from our other partner institution, FIA, says there's a group called Saving Nature in the U.S. that is working to save wildlife corridors based in Duke University. All right. And with Thank that, yeah. Thank so you, Mindy. Mariella just spoke. She's our chairperson for the specialist group. <laughs> Mariella, I think that's it for the questions. You have anything else you want to add, Mariella? Um, nope. <laughs> I understand you have any closing remarks. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I just want to thank you again, guys, for this opportunity to talk more about Amardillo Shenachter and specifically the tree bandad Amardillo in Brazil, which is um, my preferred Shenachter. So, <laughs> and so again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank Very you so much for the talk. That was extremely interesting.